Anyways, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Basil Hiley today to this uh, our summer program. He's been a dear friend of David Pete, my father, our family, and the Pari Center for many, many years. And we're just sorry today that we don't have you here in person with us, Basil. Uh, we've had some great times in Pari together. Basil has been dancing at midnight in the square in Pari. So. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And please tell them what I danced to. Um, and what is it? Um, the wall, uh, another brick in the wall. Yes. That's right, another brick in the wall. That's what uh, it is. Yes. You don't need no education. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was a wonderful session. <laughs> so Basil has worked alongside David Bohm at Burbeck College for 30 years. He is a quantum physicist and professor at the University of London and co-authored the book, The Undivided Universe with David Bohm, which is considered the main reference for Bohm's interpretation of quantum theory. Today, he's going to enlighten us on how the classical world emerges from the implicate order. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Basil, now. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I certainly wish I was in Pari, rather than sitting here with the clouds and the rain and the mizzle and the bang, usual English summer weather. Okay, uh, can I take the screen from you, Eleanor? Yep. Oh, you can Just share your screen, okay? Perfect. Okay. Can you see... Oh, what's happened? Can you see my screen? I can, yes. yes. Sorry, I can't because I've lost it behind this <laughs> wretched city zoo. Sorry, I'm not used to this technology, so please forgive me. It's okay. We can see your screen, and if you click on play... Yes, yeah. I know what... Okay, I'm nearly there. I'm there. Okay. So now, what... When I... When Eleanor asked me what would I like to talk about, I said, oh, Gailey, I'll talk about how the classical world emerges from the implicate order. Uh, and I thought... Well, that's easy. But having tried to prepare the talk, I realize it's rather difficult and it's going to be rather challenging for some of the, <clears throat> some of the people who I've met in Pari. Because <clears throat> what I find is that I, being a theoretical physicist, have very much rely on the mathematics because it's from the mathematics I try to form the concepts because the concepts are not out there for us readily available. So I please forgive me if I well I can what something's happening. Oh all right. Okay. So let me start right at the beginning. Uh, what I want to do first of all is not to start with the classical world. The classical physics is wrong. It's wrong because it doesn't work. As soon as we go down and see atoms, we can't use classical physics anymore. So there must be something underlying classical physics, which is the real McCoy, as it were. And the classical physics is just somehow a, a macroscopic averaging of something going on deeper. Okay. And this is what I learned straight away from David Bohm when I joined him, because we were actually talking about not particles moving in space and time, but process activity about becoming and how the classical world emerges from this idea of uh, process. And we had Roger Penrose with us and he was coming in not from quantum theory, but from general relativity point of view trying to, we were both trying to do the same things, uh, quantize gravity. Unfortunately, both of us have failed on that task, but it's been a lovely journey. Okay, so what I want to do in this talk is to try and explain the mathematics that lie, the ideas in the mathematics that lies behind this structure process idea. And one of the things is uh, that I keep emphasizing probably is, is the word algebra. And I think David Bohm, it's nice to remember David Bohm just here. He said to me, I don't know around the world, but we have a snake called an adder in this country. 
I don't know whether it has the same name elsewhere. But David said to me, how do you turn an adder into an algebra? And I said, I don't know. He said, oh, go and tell it to multiply. The whole point about an algebra is that there are two things you do. You can either add things or you can multiply things. And that's all you can do. And from that, magic appears. Okay. And so what I've been looking at in my professional background is these ideas of orthogonal, symplectic, Clifford algebras and geometric algebras. And hey, man, you guys, those who want to know about them, good. Those who don't want to know about them, good. I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to give you some idea of how they come about. And then when I was in your group, when in one of the, the sub-meetings, somebody said, oh, mathematics, it's like hieroglyphics, isn't it? And I thought, oh, that's an idea. Let me develop that theme and just say, I've got a set of symbols here. And we know that that is telling us about King Tut. What it's telling us, I don't know, because there's fishes, no, there's not. There's this symbol, this, sy I don't know. They knew what those symbols meant. So my mathematics is essentially the following. I've got the Schrodinger cartouche, because when I see that, I immediately see a whole structure that I've learnt, which goes under the name of Schrodinger picture. And when I see this equation here, can you see my cursor moving? Okay, good. Um, then I say, oh, that's Bohm 52. And that was the uh, one that was called hidden variables. There's nothing hidden in it at all. The mathematical symbols come directly from the Schrodinger equation simply by writing this in terms of two real fields, R and S. So instead of talking about this strange wave function, what we talk about are two components, R and S, and treat them as something real. Okay, and then this equation is it's trivial. It's simply the conservation of energy. We have the kinetic energy here. We have the classical potential energy here. And this term appears by putting that in the Schrodinger equation. So mathematically, this is exactly the same content as that. So we're not doing anything new but by doing it this way, we're looking at in terms of conservation of energy. And there's another equation which you don't want to worry about is the conservation of probability. And that's the only change from the standard approach. Now, the question is, what do we do with this equation? Incidentally, it is rather interesting that Heisenberg said this term here was ad hoc. It wasn't ad hoc. I did A-level mathematics to go from here to there. It's in the mathematics. Come on, man. Now, my question, as I said earlier, is what is it doing there? What can we learn from it? Okay. Now, you see what Bohr said was, look, how the heck does a particle get from this slip and produce these fringes. Chris was talking to you about that last, last time. Why hasn't he drawn any, any trajectories on there? Because he feels, this is the Cop this is Bohr, Copenhagen, don't ask questions as to what is going on. Just do your measurements and shut up. I'm sorry, I don't like shutting up as Eleanor will tell you. Then Wheeler comes along and he's, he, and he, he, look, I'm not criticizing these guys. They are great thinkers. I'm just trying to point out where I disagree with their thinking. I'm not trying to make fun of them, for God's sake. I have a great respect. I remember meeting John. He came into my room at Birkbeck College, and we had a good old chat about non-locality. Anyway, but he published, when we were talking about which way experiments, 
this is what quantum mechanics is. We know there's a source where the, our particles come in from the tail, and we know our detectors go click. So they're bitten. But woo, 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 woo. Whereas Bohm was saying, look, either it goes this way or it goes that way. What's the problem? And then as Chris, the, the two Chris's I call it, were responsible for this early on in the 70s, we produced this and, I, and, and this is what John Bell said, that's impossible. It's impossible. Just recently, I've been talking to Z Dieter Zay. I had to stop exchanging email because he said, it's meaningless. I'm sorry. I want to know what it means. And then, oh, but of course, we couldn't do any experiment. We didn't know how to get the, do experiments to find these damn fringes doing this. And then, my dear friend Ephraim Steinberg, from Toronto, 2011, this came out. Okay, it, it's, it's a stretch of the imagination, but I can assure you when you do experimental physics, if you get something looking like the theory, you want to go on and find out something deeper about it. But he was using light. And so our, our idea was to use particles. Now, I think this is beautiful. I don't know whether Chris showed it, but this is the quantum potential. You can actually see it. Alan, you can see it, you can feel it almost. Because here are the two slits in the background. Look at this. What is this towering, the towering inferno? The council flats. No. Okay. And the particles come along here and they go along these. This corresponds to particles going along there. And every time a particle hits this dip, the rate of change of the potential gives you a force and it flips across. And what the Toronto people were saying, you can actually see those, that, these gaps. Okay. But that is with light on. This is the, uh, the coming up to the barrier. The particles are moving up toward times along here. So they're moving up toward... It doesn't even get to the barrier and it bounces off. And was it you, Alan, who was worrying about um, uh, decay? Somebody yes. asked me a question about decay. Well, there it is. Look, it sits, the particle sits around in there, depending upon which, and then suddenly something will come through. That is decay. Even in this model, there is... You, you can't control the initial conditions. There's no experiment we can do which will give me a particle with an exact position and exact momentum. This is where the ambiguity that I was talking about comes in. Okay, are you sure the real world behaves like this, BJ? Well, I want to show you, we've been doing some experiments on argon atoms. And these are argon atoms, by the way, striking our screen. We've taken a photograph of them. But look what happens. So what we're finding is that we get the interference fringes as a statistical average over individual events. Okay, well, how do we do this? Well, we use this gigantic piece of apparatus. We put in our argon gas there. We excite. This is all in a vacuum, by the way. Vacuum almost up to space standards. And then we get the atoms going through there. And then we catch them with tweezers. Okay, it's not the tweezers you pull your hair out with. It's uh, tweezers which are made out of lasers. Amazing. And you can catch them there and then switch the laser off and hopefully they will drop. And that's what you're seeing on those photos. Now let me show you the apparatus. How about this? This is one end of it. This here, that's what we're limited with working with. Here is the cooler. Here are the pumps. 
but hang on, there's more. Here is the, uh, an extension. The gas bottle is right at the end here. So this is the apparatus. He's the pilot, Joe Morley. Uh, Peter Edmonds was the man who originally built this whole thing. And you'll see a couple of guys sort of trying to get in on the act. One of them is Bob Calligan and, well, you know who the other one is. They don't like us in experimental domain theoreticians. We always make things go wrong. Okay, so here we have the, this is now putting these bits together. The source, which gets trapped in here, which we then release so that it goes through the two slits and produces the effect. Now, I did have a lovely movie, but it doesn't work anymore. This one works. Yeah. Okay. And then, the reason why I'm doing this is because I can actually measure the speed of the particles starting from the source here and ending up on the screen. And I can do that with this diagram. Here are the particles arriving. It's time at the bottom here. Here are the particles arriving at the screen. This is the light source because when we get these things excited, we have to have them in excited states. Light is emitted, so we take the light, gets there in no time at all, the speed's so quick we don't have to worry about it. And then that enables us to measure the distance it, it, it travels and the time when we, when we uh, see the difference between those two signals. Okay, so we know something is traveling between the source and the sink. And I refuse to leave it as a blank in the way the Copenhagen do it, does it? Okay, so how does, what, can we say anything? Well, I go back to Zeno's paradox. His paradox, I'm putting very simply, how can it be at a point X and yet move with a speed at that point X? How can it be at X and moving at X at the same time? Okay, now how do we measure speed? Well, we say the start, the finishing distance, and we measure the time it takes to travel that. And then we go to the limit, we squeeze, because we're going down to the very small. It's all right with cars. We can't squeeze a car down to 10 to the minus eight centimeters, even if you hit a brick wall. Okay, so then the question is at what point is it at X1? Is it at X2? Or is it at some point in between? And what classical mechanics says is the speed is the, 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 the take a midpoint, and this is continuous. This It's called a derivative. This speed is continuous. And that's Newton's first law of motion. For people who live in Finland, they know all about first law of motion on the ice. Right, but what Chris showed was that this actually bends here. So why is it bending? Why have we got this, this thing suddenly bending? Is it got a force there? Because that's usually, you've got to give it a, a hit if you want to move it off the straight line. No, it's the quantum potential energy that comes into play. So there's something subtle going on in that area. Now I want to introduce something which I think is new to most people and that is known as Gromov's no squeezing theorem and it was uh, 1985 that it was proved although when I talked to my high energy colleagues at UCL oh we know that but we don't call it that theorem they call it they, they, they're trying to get something with their beams and it doesn't work. What Gromov says that if you get a, a dense spec set of particles coming out of an orifice, you find that under Hamilton's equations of motion, you end up with a beam which has the same area. And that, I, I won't, and that, no, I'll just leave it there. And what this is, is the symplectic camel. 
as my friend Maurice de Gosson says. You can't squeeze that sphere into a long, narrow distribution to get it through the eye of a needle. So you have to take that, and this is very important for us to realize that there's this no squeezing theorem. Now, if we're using process, we can think about Hamilton's equations of motion as a flow from this region to that region. So we're thinking about flows now. Not particles, flying, just flows. And the flow we can get from a, we can generate it from a function, which is class, what is called classical action, doesn't matter about that. And it gives you the bone momentum. And if you go back to the equation that I did for the bone cartouche, you'll see that this is the momentum that appears in the second term to give you the kinetic energy. And this is the first term, which is the total energy. So it comes out of this flow. So we're actually talking about the process of flow. We do this classically and we get this equation, but there's no quantum potential there. The only difference between the classical world in this picture and the quantum world is the appearance of that quantum potential. Okay, so let me just summarize the classical, but what we do now in quantum mechanics, we change this S from the action. I don't ask me what the action means because I have no physical picture of it at all. I don't even know why it's called action, but that's what they used. But it now becomes a phase, and I know what the phase is because the phase is, if you have the background there, then you have these constant phase surfaces. And I think Chris did actually mention that in his presentation last time. Okay, now then, one of the things that we're going to notice is the phase always appears in this, it appears upstairs. I'm sorry, I wish, for those people who don't know mathematics, just take the pictures I'm trying to get across, it's upstairs. And what we're doing is we're lifting the classical motion to get the quantum motion out. And the lifting means turning that into this exponential, into the phase. Now, this is mathematicians did this. And, and I, I don't pretend to be a mathematician there. Turn it upside down and you'll see the classical motion is on top of this deeper underlying process, which requires two points to talk about it, not one point to talk about it. And that two points is what I meant by this ambiguity. And so I can now bring out a very simple picture, Gromov's sphere, flow to Gromov's sphere. In classical physics, you can take that sphere and put it equal to a point <clears throat> in quantum mechanics, you cannot do that. Okay, now then. We're talking about trajectories and in the Feynman approach, he talks about trajectories as well. He talks about paths. So let me do what Chris was doing, he first of all says these flow lines go straight, oops, sorry about that, I've touched something I shouldn't have done. Um, I've got these flow lines and when there's no obstacles in the way, box one goes into box one, box two goes into box, uh, and so on. When I put this slit in the way, I suddenly find Box three goes into box one. That's the particle coming out of this box, ends up in this box here. But this is just the wave function. This is just the wave function. It's the receptacle in which we put these objects when they finished. 
and we measure them. That's why, we, that's why everybody's worried about measuring the wave function. But they don't want to collapse it because we want to, we want to know about this. We want to know about what's going on in between. And the way the physicists do it is just collect all these together in an array. What's happened? I now know how to get rid of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm learning the technology. I'm driving this technology along as I go and learning. Okay. So this means I've just got one path. And now the difference between these two is just noughts now. Oh, three appears down the diagonal, three, three because it goes straight through, but the other ones that are deflected suddenly appear in other positions. So this is the, this is the operator formalism of quantum mechanics, which you can see what it means in a couple of seconds. It's just describing all the processes together. And that's why we're getting averages. And if we add these paths up, that's Feynman's path integral approach. And the only reason why I've got this slide up is because the process... Oh, shice. Sorry, I, how do I get back again? It just goes on and on and on. I've made a mistake. I'm getting excited here, Eleanor. Uh, uh, instead, use the, the arrow to the left bezel, then it goes back up. Which arrow to the left? What, what, which arrow to the left? Oh, you mean, sorry. Voila. No, that's still going. Oh, yes, it does. Thank you. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad somebody knows what they're talking about. Right. So what I want here is I want to, to, to note that down the diagonal is being. Because it goes from one box to the same box. And we are diagonal elements because we put few food in and I won't say what we do with the waste but we remain the same and the becoming is the process okay now you do that with the position but you can also do the same thing with the momentum but now we can't specify okay we can't specify P and Q at the same time because of this blasted Gromov business. And what Heisenberg, brilliant, brilliant, showed was this corresponds to the fact that if you first operate with P and then operate with Q, it's not the same as first operating with Q and then with P. And what he showed was that area, because it only goes down to H bar, the difference between these two is equal to h bar. Forget about the i, not important. Okay, so now you guys can go and pass any paper in quantum mechanics. Well, almost. Okay, now then, what, what is the uncertainty principle is saying? They're saying you know where the particle is, but you don't know how fast it's going, or you know how fast it's going, but you don't know where it is. Okay, we're, we're stupid people. But I can assure you the argon atom knows exactly where it's going. It doesn't have a lack of knowledge. It's doing what comes naturally. Therefore, to, this, is, this, is, this is this tremendous dilemma that people get when they're looking at quantum mechanics. Is the uncertainty due to our stupidity or is there an intrinsic uncertainty in nature? Okay, so, and, and that, that, those two sentences are being tra translated into Q being diagonal if you know where it is, or P being diagonal if you know where it is. Now then, how are we going to talk about movement? Because remember, David Bohm actually said it's enfolding and unfolding. Well, suppose we have Q being diagonal at I, and then these terms get shuffled around, and then it's diagonalized again. In other words, there's a process which is lost in this operation, in this mathematics that we're using, 
The process that's lost is the shuffling. And the bone thing is saying, no, I can talk about. It. Look, this says I can talk about. Bone tells me the momentum is at the point, but the momentum must be defined in this way. So what Bohm is doing, he's saying, I'm going to assume that the P's and Q's are well-defined, but the process of going, the actual unfolding process, is that it folds, unfolds, etc. Okay, so here's the, the, the shuffling is, you, you shuffle the matrices around, that there's some very complicated process going on there. And it's not, uh, we don't know what's going on there, but the whole point is we, we can do lots of things to find out what is going on there. So that, it's very interesting. Well, why did Heisenberg actually write this RE to the IS? You'll see RE to the IS is the signature of everything that David Bohm did. If in doubt, if it's an operator, write it as an amplitude with a phase. And then what Heisenberg did was to say, all right, let me call that phase frequency. Now, why? Because atoms are quantized. And we have these spectral lines rather than the continuum. And then the rule that they found was that if you go from E, sorry, I can't see it at the moment because I can't see it. Wait, it, it, it's EN. I can, I can read it. Don't worry. I've got your pictures over the top of me. EN to EM. Take the energy difference. It gives you a frequency. That frequency is the same as the sum of the transition from there to there and the transition from there to there. And we call that the Ritz. Rittberg combination principle, because it works all the time. And if you put this in the exponential, a multiplication, because it's squared terms that gives you the energy, you add the frequencies. And that's why Heisenberg did this. Okay. And that's why it comes out time and time again. Okay. Now what Bohm did was to turn this into a structure process. So you can either talk about Q going from N to M, or you can talk about it going intermediate state, intermediate state. So in fact, the actual motion, you have to sum over all these. So the actual underlying process that's going on is more like a fractal. And Alan, now you see where the ambiguity is coming in, where your creativity might be coming in that this is just a statistical average of all these underlying processes. And how about this? Anthony Gormley's brilliant statue, which I am told was inspired by a lecture I gave once. Everything was about relations. And I think this is a beautiful, thank you, Anthony. Great man. Anyway, and that's on the South Bank in, here in London. Okay, so now we see, what do we see? We see something. Let's go, let's go on. Oh, yeah. Come on, you're kidding me about this folding and unfolding. Well, there was an experiment that um, Sir George Porter had, and he was using this to illustrate something entirely different. You have a central cylinder and you put some glycerin in a transparent container. And then you put a spot of dye in here. And Eleanor, can I, can I try something? And I'm sorry, it might be, it's all right, she's, she's looking at me to wonder what the hell I'm gonna try. What, I, what happens is, if you put a spot of dye in there and wind it up, it disappears. And then if you unwind it, it reappears again. And I'm sorry, it's got adverts in it, and it's a bit loud. Turn your volumes down. The sum up card reader makes card payments easy. I'm sorry, I'm not getting paid no, for this contact. advert, by the way. Oh, we don't see it. 
Hazel, we don't see the video. You can't see the video? No. no. We can hear it, but we can't see it. Oh, jeepers creep. How do I do that then? <laughs> the grey screen. So now you stop sharing screen. Yeah, there we are. Oh, there, okay. There it is. Sorry, can, I, I don't need to go back, do I? There's the drop. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Just... I'm sorry about the music, it's not my choice. And it doesn't go completely because he put too much dye in there. But watch when it goes backwards. Come on, mate, get a move on. I actually had Sir George Porter lent me his apparatus, but then he says, no, I don't want it back again. I don't know how to get rid of this thing. Please ignore it. Here we're coming. Here we're coming. Isn't it magic? Isn't it magic? Okay, now then, I've got to get out of this. Uh, stop sharing, and then I'm going to come. It is laminar flow today, and you know this oh. about me. I love laminar flow. Hang There's on, cool I've got to kill it. I've got to kill it. Talks about how laminar flow works, but we're doing what? Go away, you horrible, horrible man. Uh, Oh God, now I've lost everything. <laughs> Let me try. No, I'm, it's all here still. <laughs> I hope. Yes. Oh, how about that? Have you got that back again? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, oh, great. Okay. So that's the, so we put the dot in there. Then we give it end turns, nothing. Okay, but well, what is this? This is just the movement is just the continuity of form and not of substance. That is, it's not a little brick ball, little billiard ball that goes through. You actually get folding and unfolding. And this is essentially the implicate order and the explicate order in my language. Okay, so that's where it comes from. Now then, what was interesting was that you can actually get Heisenberg's equation of motion out of this in a very simple way. E is the explicate order, that's the drop. You then multiply it by a name which folds it, enfolds it into the background. You then have another one which unfolds it from the background and you've moved to a new point. This is your basic equation. And what we, uh, if we identify these things, it, this is called uh, a modular automorphism if you want to be really show off. It's a well-known mathematical trick, but it's simply the enfolding unfolding. And there's a very deep theorem which takes pages and pages to go through the Tomita Takasaki theorem, which says you can write M as just the Hamiltonian times the unfolding parameter, not time. And then if you just expand that, if you're a mathematician, you know how to do it. If not, don't worry. That becomes that to order T, that throw away everything above tor squared. Clear, clear that up and you get Hamilton's equation of motion. But what about shooting? Oh, and the row, the E, is just the density. And in fact, if you write E is equal to AB, you can split these equations apart and you can get two Schrodinger equations. Here's one Schrodinger equation, I've written it with A's instead of a size. And this one is the complex conjugate Schrodinger equation. And I felt very clever when I did this because I invented it all myself. And then I was reading Paul Dirac's paper in 1930. He actually had exactly the same thing. 
and he actually talks about folding and unfolding in his book, The Principles of Quantum Theory. He actually has the bone theory in his book, Principles of Quantum Theory, in 1947, Eleanor. And I think David got it from there. Anyway, so whether that helps or not, I don't know, but it, it, it's not pulled out of the air. Then here's this polar decomposition appearing again. And if you write it in the modern world, word, I'd like to call this the brown, the, the brown highly cartouche, if I may because we published this, we tried to publish this equation and the, the uh, FizRev were not very interested because they didn't understand what we were doing. So trouble with referees. But this equation is very important because what it enables one to do is to take Bohm's ideas and to deal with spin and also to deal with relativity. You'll see in a lot of the elementary discussions of the bone theory, they can't do relativity. I was going to say something beginning with B then, but I've checked myself. We can do something. And this comes from these two equations. And this is... Uh, now I've learned it. I've learned something. And this is the commutator that we saw the order with the difference. And this is called a Jordan product. And I don't think we can, Jordan doesn't get mentioned very often. And there's a problem here, a political problem, because Jordan actually was in the SA, not the SS, but in the SA. And I'll leave that just for that comment. Okay, now how do we get back to the paths again? Well, what we do is we say, okay, it uh, unfolds, enfolds, unfolds, enfolds. And this is Dirac speaking now, it's not me, not David. So we can regard, he says, it looks like a trajectory and thus makes quantum mechanics more closely resemble classical physics. That was in 1945. But then, no, and Feynman saw what Dirac had written and said, all right, let me take the exponential again, this thing. And then, because Bohm is the ratio of this thing over time, it's essentially the speed multiplied by the mass. And then remember the story I started with, where do you put, if you go to the limit, where do you put the, the point? Is it the beginning, the end, or is it the midpoint? So let's take the midpoint. And this is what, in fact, Feynman did. So what we have is an incoming velocity to the point and an outgoing velocity. In classical physics, always straight line. But in quantum physics, it can be anything like this at all. Now, sorry, I'm not a good navigator, but I'm learning. And then what we find is that the mean value that we're using, this bone momentum, actually appears here. Okay. Right. Let's go on a bit further. So what the bone, what Ball would say was, we've got some probability of finding the particle here. We've got some probability of finding the particle here, and we get the probability current flowing from one to the other. And that's all I want to know. But I'm saying, no, I've now shown you how you can do it with the individual particle itself. What happens is, because you're in this region, the number of momenta coming out is sprayed. The number coming in here is sprayed. So effectively, what you've got to do is to average over all the possible momenta, possible kinks in those paths. So what we're doing is averaging over many paths for the classical world to emerge. 
and then the bone momentum actually turns out to be the average, the mean momentum of all these. Now, what I would have loved to have done, with you know, it's nearly time, is to actually show you how you get that result. But you have to go to another structure, and there it was in that structure that I saw a way of actually proving this result. So it's mathematically proven. Now then, I want to, yes, I've got time. What I want to do now is Feynman got into trouble. So Feynman was doing what we're doing, what everybody else was doing, what Drac was doing. And we can talk about sociology afterwards. But what Feynman did was to say, all right, we've got the momentum, we've got the velocity, but we really need to look at the kinetic energy. Now, the kinetic energy is V squared. So it should be this. But he found he had to write it like this. In other words, he had to split the incoming velocity from the outgoing velocity. Why? Because if he did this, he got an infinite amount of energy as epsilon goes to zero, as the difference time between the two points goes to zero. It blows up. But was Richard Feynman worried? Not at all. What he said is, you know, how, how, how do I, how, how, where is this, what is that, how can I get rid of this energy? And then he said, let me change the rest mass of the particle to the rest mass one plus delta, where delta is a small change for a short time, say epsilon, that's my epsilon. So the immediate thing is why? And he doesn't tell us. He just says, do it. And nobody seems to say why. But we now have a story about mass renormalization, blah, blah, blah. But hold it. This is a squared term. And what we find, look at the work of Morris and myself, what we find is that the quantum potential never appears until you go to order S H squared. So what he's missing here is the quantum potential. And if you put the quantum potential in, you get the right result. <clears throat> and now the interesting thing is de Broglie. Remember, Chris was saying it's the de Broglie bone theory that uh, that he was talking about and used de Broglie's name, said he didn't get enough credit. Well, now I'm going to give him extra credit now. What de Broglie said was the appearance of the quantum potential makes it look as if the mass has changed. I've had to put squares here because I'm going to relativity. Just don't worry about it. There's a reason for doing this. The point is the rest mass has changed. And that's exactly what, Dirac, what Feynman did. And Dirac, uh, sorry, and, and De Bruyne was told to, in no uncertain terms, to drop dead, which he did very shortly afterwards. But we can take the delta because Feynman says it's delta. And if you look at uh, the uh, the mean value you find here is the kinetic energy and the quantum potential energy. You just can't get away from it. It's there. And the reason why I've got Rob's name on here flat is because we are designing an experiment to show these kinks in the trajectories. Okay, so just let me summarize. We've got this uncertainty, this ambiguity giving rise to uh, a, a curve which is an ensemble average. So here's the zigzag. Now, Alan, you see we've got the freedom in there to be creative. But what becomes determinant is the average of these individual trajectories. And those averages are what are known as the bone trajectories. But they come from this Enfolding, unfolding, enfolding, unfolding, underlying process. 
It averages over a whole lot of them. And now I'm sorry, folks, for the people who find mathematics rather challenging. Let me give you a, my artist's impression of what's going on. This process here is very much like representing the movement as an impressionist painting. You don't have to draw straight lines. And this is, I'm sorry folks, whoever wants to believe in Bohmian mechanics, they don't have my blessing. Because what it is, it's essentially an Emmet railway. Chris got very angry with me for saying that the other day, by the way. Okay, can I now, yes, just right, can I now bring it to a close? I think I've now shown Alan why I couldn't answer your question in three words. Because there is a deeper underlying structure, not only a structure in words, but a structure we can actually bring out and discuss in a mathematical in mathematical terms. Okay, so let's have a look at the overarching philosophy. What I'm saying is there is a deeper structure which gives rise to a non-commutative, and now I'm bringing in a technical term, phase space. Phase space means talking in terms of momentum and position. A phase space, it's a dynamical geometry. And in this context, not everything, not all orders can be made explicit at the same time. And I use this lovely uh, uh, psychology gestalt, which you probably, most of you know. I, if, because I can't see the audience, usually what I say is, do you see the old lady or the young lady in that drawing? And it's usually 50-50. And I always think there's something wrong with me because the first one that strikes me is the old lady. And all I want to see is the beautiful young lady. Can you see it? I hope everybody can see it. Here's the mouth of the old lady. Here's the chin of the young lady looking that way. Okay. But now it's not just the question of our perceiving that the Moyal algebra, which I didn't have time to mention except in the last slide, shows you that what you do is you take all the structure in X and you transform it all over the momentum space and vice versa. In other words, the whole process is a non-local process from the start. And if you guys are worried about non-locality, action at a distance, and this is not action at a distance, it is the process itself cannot be described in local terms. And I like to exaggerate things by saying the quantum processes are not going on in space-time. I'm demonstrating all the effects in space-time, but they're not going on in space-time. They're going on in this dynamical structure, which refuses to be pinned down. I can pin them down to a degree when I use the algebraic way of doing it, but then I have to project out shadow manifolds, this is my X position space. This is my momentum space. Remember those two pictures earlier on. And if I can neglect the quantum potential, voila, we arrive at the classical world. So that is the structure. I just want one last transparency, but I think that is my attempt to show how from the implicate order, the classical world emerges in a physical context, in physics context. Now, this is about matter, but David had much wider views. 
He was talking about thought, ultimately. And I found it very interesting that when I went back, I think one of the problems with modern people is they don't go back and read what the actual guys who really contributed to their subject were saying. I think there's a feeling, oh, they're old-fashioned. But they're not. I mean, in Hamilton, he was talking about the algebra of pure time. Come on, what the hell does that mean? In algebra, relations are between successive states of some changing thing or thought. In Grassman, mathematics is about thought, not material reality. Mention Grassman, we use Grassman variables almost every day in theoretical physics. And he was the man responsible for that. Mathematics is about thought, not material reality. It's about the relationships of form, not the relationships of content. Ordering forms in thought and not located in space-time. And mathematics is not about material things, not necessarily, I should have put in there, material things in space-time. And one of the things that David Bowman, I hope Paavo Bulkanen talks about it, I'm sure he will, is that the quantum potential we were proposed, David and I, that it was an informational potential. There was a new form of causality, not the efficient causality, but a formative causality. We're going back to Aristotle. The formative causality, why would, did I say that? Because if you look at the mathematical structure of the quantum potential in all the situations we've explored, it contains information about the experimental environment. It contains information about whether it's a one slit, two slit, whether it's a diffraction grating, et cetera, et cetera, is encoded in the quantum potential. So it's encoded in this extra energy, this new quality of energy, the quantum potential energy. And you actually take the quantum potential energy from the classical kinetic energy. And there's a magnificent image of that, which I think I'd like to leave you with. I love Formula One Grand Prix racing. I don't know how many guys there, but now they have a Kerr system. Don't know whether you ever have heard of it. The Kerr system is kinetic energy retrieval system. What does it do? You scream up at a hell of a rate and you jam your brakes on. Normally, those brakes would just dissipate all the energy and dissipate it as heat into the atmosphere. But these guys make it charge a battery. So they're actually distinguishing their car with two forms of energy, the kinetic energy, and this internal energy, which they put back into the battery again. And this is very much like that expression I had. I wonder if I can get back to it now. I've been taught how to do it. No, the only trouble is I don't know. Oh yeah, this is it. Take you back to this equation down the bottom here. This is the kinetic energy, and this is the quantum potential energy. And this is, I'd say, like the Kerr system in a Formula One racing. It's different, but it's like, remember, I'm talking metaphors all the time. Here's the kinetic energy. When you put the brakes on, instead of letting that energy disappear, dissipate into the atmosphere, you pull it back again into battery charging. So you're making it useful work rather than dissipation. Okay, folks. I think that's, yeah. Oh, no, I think I didn't go through this, but you can read it. Thought is about becoming and not being. And being is a relatively invariant process. The basic ingredients is activity, 
and that's described in mathematical terms in elements of an algebra. Okay, folks, that's all. Thank you so much, Basil. Um, that was very inspiring. And we now have an hour uh, for conversation. And conversation could be that you share a reflection, like something that clarified for you or something that resonated with you. Or it could be a question for Basil, uh, based on what you've heard or what that even sparked for you. As we are a big group, we uh, suggest to use the, the raise hand uh, function. So if you click on participants, there is this button, raise hands and then we can bring you in. If you don't find that function, then you can also just write it in the chat um, that you would like to come in and share something. And feel free to share your insights as well in the chat. So who has a reflection or a question for Basil or someone else in the group? Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, Oliver, did you want to say something? Oh. You're muted, Oliver. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I have a question to Basil. Uh, it's a little bit technical, but I hope uh, he will give us a non technical answer. Uh, as you know, Basil, there is a string of folks uh, who work. Uh, on what they call the Bohmian mechanics, which is very similar to Bohm's original ideas, except that they were able to derive uh, motion uh, equations uh, without the quantum potential. Uh, so my question, what, what kind we lose if we abandon the quantum potential? So, or in other words, what is so specific about the quantum potential in the Bohm approach uh, to quantum mechanics? Okay, yes. Thank you, Oval. Oval, thank you for that. If you look at the way they derive, they, they say they have proved the guidance condition, which is what I've been calling the Bohm momentum. They claim they've got a proof of that. I'm sorry, I do not believe that proof, and they would not have got that proof if they did not know already what Bohm had discovered. Uh, sorry, I think Olivar's disappeared. He's gone... I think he's still there. It's just a turn to Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. okay. I'm here. Right. You, were, you were stationary for so long. <laughs> I thought I turned you into stone. <laughs> no. Does that help? No. Yeah. There's a second part. You said, what do I gain by having the quantum potential in there? I gain a hell of a lot. I no longer have to worry about the collapse of the wave function. I don't have to you necessarily you no wait a minute, I'm very careful. But it all no, it gives me another way of thinking about what is going on. And I think it's very important when we come to deal with quantum gravity. Now that's a technical technical discussion which I won't go into. But we need something extra to actually deal with. And I think if we can actually do this exp experiment and confirm what the Toronto boys had got with their photons, I think it's going to open up a whole new discussion. The Bohmian mechanics opens up nothing new. It just does what Chris was doing. It just shows you these pictures. Now, is that all you need? I don't think so. I don't see how you explain the non-locality. The non-locality is actually built into the quantum formalism itself. And what you find with, say, doing the 
de Bois-Bohm approach to two particles, the two particle Schrodinger equation. I'm sorry, I just didn't have time to talk about this non-locality in my talk. But if you do this, you find that you don't quite know what to make of the fact that the connection between these two particles that are entangled, there's no signaling going between them. So what do you make of that in the in Bohmian mechanics? You can't deal with it. How do you deal with particle annihilation and creation? You can't deal with it. But in this way uh, of looking more closely at the quantum formalism, not by taking the Copenhagen interpretation into account, but by actually looking at it in this way of telling us about the underlying dynamical structure of process. It opens up a whole new way of looking at things. And that's why I have been very fascinated with it. Unfortunately, at the moment, it hasn't led me to anything which is new in physics. But that's because I'm stupid. <laughs> Thank you, Basil. Um, we have another question from Alain de Cat. Alain, you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, you know, I cannot say that I understand everything, but, but from last week's uh, presentation from Chris and the one today, I can see you know, how this uh, quantum potential is really a game changer in the in the, the world of quantum physics. And I, I was wondering if, if this discovery or this view, way of looking at things is now widely accepted by, uh, by the wide, um, let's say, quantum physics community or if there are still non-believers. And if yes, what are the other theories? I'm, I'm afraid there are still many non-believers. But I put that down to not the fact that they are non-believers because they've looked at it, examined it, and therefore come to a conclusion, I'm not going to worry about that because there's something wrong with it. The problem is they don't look at it. There's so much going on in the world of theoretical physics that it's got to have some shock to make them go and look at it. And those people who do look at it suddenly say, What's wrong with it? I did that myself. I did that, as Chris told you last week. He came along to me and said, why don't you talk about the Bohm early paper, a 52 paper? And I muttered something, oh, because it's wrong. And then they said, but where is it wrong? And I sort of started mumbling, you know, like all supervisors trying to be clever. And I thought, no, BJ, you, you, you've got to come clean. You haven't read it properly. You haven't read it properly. So I went home, and over the weekend I read it, and I thought, well, I can't see anything wrong with it. And computers were just becoming friendlier, although after Chris described his cards that he had to sort out, I'm not sure they're very friendly then. But he managed to get the computers to produce these these pictures that, that he showed and that I showed in static form. You can do it. So why don't people why don't people look at it and say, oh that's interesting. But not to some of them actually saying, oh it's a waste of time. I mean I still am very worried by this uh, by my exchange with with Dieter Zay just said, it's meaningless. And I'm sorry, it comes out of the formalism that we use. And I thought as physicists, we look at our formalism and we say, what does this mean? So I don't know. I think it's fashion. It is changing. I'm getting a lot more interest in youngsters coming up to me and saying, tell me about it. And I think things are changing now. In the, certainly in the school I'm in, it's a high energy school, and they're suddenly hitting the buffers. 
they've got to think of something else to do because the money involved is, is, is enormous and they're very worried. This is all private, by the way. Don't tell anybody. Thank you. Uh, so we have quite a few questions and we're hoping to give space to all of them. So but let's start with Chris. Chris Dot Hunter, and then after that, we'll move to Lely. Chris, you want to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is um, more a reflection than a question, but um, thank you particularly, Basil, for the this question, what does this mean, which you keep on coming back to, and I think that is such an important thing. Um, so... Um, I wanted to pick up then on this statement, thought is about becoming, not being. And becoming and not being has been something I've been struggling with for, uh, based on basically from Plato um, uh, for some time. Um, and somebody may be able to help me on that. Um, and then relating that to... Um, the fundamental difference between rest and movement, um, that all uh, one of the characteristics of life is intention, that it has a, it has a direction of movement, which is determined by intention. And when you take this through to the physical world, it's it's that that intention is the equivalent of it is potential energy. I did mention this to Basil when I last time I saw saw him. And so this is why I think that this, there's such a fundamental uh, relationship there between rest and movement, um, being and becoming, uh, potential energy, and in particular, what is um, uh, quantum potential. And they're all, uh, the, if, if you could relate them together, that's the answer maybe to the question, what does this mean? Thank you, Chris. Yes, no, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. But please don't forget, I had this struggle of being uh, in, 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 in the mathematics. But you see, being, uh, can I be technical? No. Sorry, I'm just thinking how to do this without becoming technical. <clears throat> you see, being is essentially something oh yeah i can do it from the from the diagram being remember were those elements in that diagonal array and they were going from one box to the another box the same box but the boxes don't have to be in different places so you're going from one box you're going from your box into the same box in other words you're changing without changing. And I think of a human being. What are we doing? We are actually changing all the time, but we still remain me. So in fact, we don't, we, we, being is not stationary. Being to me is repeating into yourself all the time. P multiplied by P is equal to P. Just like one is multiplied by one is equal to one. We are the whole, we are a oneness. And therefore, that's what I mean by being. I don't know whether that helps, Chris. Very much, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Laylee. Hi, thank you so much. This has been really fascinating. I'm a non-physicist and I did my graduate work, my PhD work with David Pete, which was a great honor for me. And I'd like to ask a really off the wall question. It is not directly related to this lecture, but I've been asking different physicists for several years. And I think um, Basil, maybe you have a point of view on this that would be useful to me. From the point of view of a physicist, how could you, would you describe what happens when E equals MC squared, when matter converts to the form of 
energy or vice versa? Well, that, 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 that is the basic thing that we've been trying to understand. And the point is that matter and energy are exactly the same thing. They're just different forms of energy. How can I help? In, you see, let me go back to the Formula One motor race. I'm sorry, the Formula One motor racing idea. The energy is stored in the, in the battery. So the rest mass is a bit like a battery of the particle. So it has energy in it. And if you can release that energy by changing its mass, that's what we've got when we get the atomic bomb, unfortunately, because we're actually, it's called destroying mass, but I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. We're converting energy trapped as mass into dynamical energy. And I think energy is the key to what I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want the quantum potential to energy rather than the Bohmian mechanics, which hides it. I want to bring it out in the open. I'm a bit like a chemist, you see, because a chemist talks about Helmholtz free energy, talks about Gibbs free energy. There's all these different kinds of energy that one uses in the chemical world. I think we have traces of them in the underlying world, but it's by changing energy from one form to another form. And that's what mass and energy, the question you asked, were, was all about. So there is no, don't think of anything as a billiard ball. There are no billiard balls in our life. One of the interesting, th no, you see, yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go down this story. You see, one of the things that we, are, we, we feel so important is that there are entities, there are material entities. We go out and buy the damn things. <laughs> but suppose we then say, all right, I've got this, this, this billiard ball, let me take that. You see, I spend most of my time in doing things I shouldn't be doing. You look at a billiard ball and you say, all right, now where is the substance? Where is the, the, the hard thing of that billiard ball? Because if you look at it through an x-ray, it's just a whole series of atoms with lots of space between them. Okay, the atom. And then Rutherford showed that the atom was actually a nucleus with the electrons floating around outside, huge gaps. It wasn't a solid thing. Okay, neutron. But you look at the neutron and you find it's full of quarks, which appear and disappear. There is, it, the, the proton or the neutron actually is one mass of activity. But for some reason, which we, well, we can, we can make stories up, but it's concentrated in a particular region. So what we're, for the conversion from mass to energy, is just we're releasing that trapped energy. And who knows, we might be able to re re release trapped energy in different ways if we take seriously the question of the quantum potential. In other words, can we look at another way of organizing our energy? And boy, do we need energy reorganizing. Anyway, I hope that helps. Thank you. Oh, great. So um, the next one is Jaroslaw. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And if not, please introduce yourself. Jaroslaw, I had a question in the chat. Are you still with us? Yeah. Yes, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yeah, so there is a lot of noise here that I want, that I want to talk a lot about. Uh, I'm very glad to 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 watch the lecture, and my question was: if if this theory is related to the non-commutative geometry? That was the question, technical kind of. 
sorry, is it related to non-commutative geometry? Yes. If, yes, if, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay, but absolutely. this theory actually was going to to unite gravity and quantum physics, if, as far as I know. Yeah, well, that, I don't know whether you heard my original comments, but that was what uh, I originally set out to do as a young PhD student, starting with David Bone for the first time. No, I'm sorry, in lectureship, starting with da uh, David Bone was not my supervisor. I had a different supervisor at King's. I came in from solid state physics. But what my aim was that having secured a job at Birkbeck, I was going to quantize gravity. Okay, yeah, well, that looks familiar, <laughs> this non-commutative algebra. And, and then it's the non-commutative yeah. algebra. Yeah. But it's I Alan, said, Alan Kahn, I think. Alan yeah. Kahn used it. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I saved you all that because if you wanted me to talk about that, you'd lose all the yeah. audience. It's and difficult it's, technical stuff. And sorry, can I have a quick question? When some people talk about the mysticism with the David Bohm connecting, but is there any way you can influence the world using the, the implicate order? Because normally there is no signal transfer, there's no sending any information, but some mystically oriented people can say it can be used for telepathy or clairvoyance, whatever. That, that, that's an interesting question. I'm afraid I'm a solid, I'm a solid state physicist as well as being a solid physicist. I did get into that at one stage. Can I confess here, Eleanor? You don't mind me confessing? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> um, I met some people from, from, I think, Eleanor, you probably know this because David was, David, your, your David, your father was very interested in this kind of thing. And Monty Ullman, I think his name was. Montague Ullman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Montague. Okay, thank you, Maureen. But I did have lots of discussions with him and uh, wondering whether, in fact, telepathy could be explained in this way. But the trouble is, it, it's almost phenomena. You can't pin it down in a way that I would like to pin it down as a scientist. So I just have to say, oh, that's interesting, but I would not get involved in it myself. That's up to other people to see if there really is anything in it or not. Okay, but the whole of, of the wholeness, it means basically you change the Hamiltonian of the whole universe, but there is no sending of information within implicate order. You cannot send some information uh, to the other people or something like that. That, that, the, 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 that. That's one of the interesting things about the quantum potential. It's actually private. Okay. It can be a group of people, a, a group of particles that are entangled, and they go through another group of particles that are entangled. If there's no classical interaction between the two, they don't see each other's quantum potential. Okay, but the, the whole, like the Hamiltonian of the universe is changed if you change, if you well, measure one. I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't do that. What we're doing is the, the secret of the wholeness comes in. Are you a physicist, by the way? No, I've got a degree in chemistry, but just you can okay. say. I no, it, it, it's to do with the completeness relation. Mm -hmm. The completeness relation has to be said. It, it, it's, sorry, folks, it's technical. The completeness relationship has to be satisfied. So it's within that system that you had the completeness relation that there is a, a Hamiltonian. I don't know what the Hamiltonian of the universe is. Well, Doesn't some people say that. for the, like the, the Willard David equation has it possibly. Or, yeah, or, but I, I, I wouldn't. I've played with that. I don't believe that's the way to go. Okay. But just, just okay. my belief. Other people believe it is the way to go, but it's not. I don't believe it's the way to go. It's, I can't make anything of it. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for the answering my question. Okay. I will go on mute now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have Ellen and then Eddie, who would like to come in with a question. So first, Ellen, over to you. Ellen Questel. Sorry, I, I didn't have a question. No, 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 Ellen. Ellen. Oh, well, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Actually, <clears throat> I asked two questions. Um, I think, and, and someone in the group answered me, but I am clearly a non-physicist and non-mathematician. The uh, demonstration with the gel and the drop of dye made me wonder whether the um, explicate changes wh whether the explicate can feed back into the implicate and affect changes or whether everything is a kind of fixed form. I'm not sure if I'm asking. No, that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. And please, I don't hold anything against people who find mathematics difficult. I just happen to find it easy for some reason. Right. I just happen to have a brain which works in a crazy way. No, you're quite right. The whole point about this form is that it's not deterministic. And the mm -hmm. explicate order does get folded back into the implicate order. Mm -hmm. And then a new explicate order emerges. Yeah. So it's, it, and that's where I think evolution actually may find its ultimate source. That's... <clears throat> A relief to hear. Thank you. No, no that, that, it, this is not deterministic. And right. that's why it's so, it looks deterministic. Yeah. The bone theory mm -hmm. looks deterministic because you're averaging over this deeper process. Mm -hmm. Averaging is fine, but the deeper process can produce different kinds of averages. That's very helpful, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Very good question. And Eddie. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation, Basil. I, I love your passion. Um, two questions. One is, when you talk about the quantum potential and the implicate order, do you mean they're one and the same thing is one question. And the second question is, when you have mentioned before that there's still work to be done with regard to the mathematics, if that work turns out to be successful when you conclude it, what will that mean? Wow, okay. First question, uh, really the, the idea of the implicate explicate order is an overarching philosophy. Rather than having the mechanical model as an overarching philosophy, we need something radically new. And what David Bohm gave us was the overarching philosophy in which we could begin to make sense of the mathematics that we're using. The quantum potential actually comes out of the mathematics we're using. And I think you'll find that one of the answers may be that the guys who advocate Bohmian mechanics have an overall arching philosophy of mechanics, not of the implicate order as David Bohm had it. So that's loosening up the philosophical background, but the quantum potential should not be identified with the implicate order. The imp I, I identify the algebra with the implicate order because you can say things with the algebra that doesn't, that carries the implicate order, sorry, carries the explicate order in it in an implicate way. When I was talking about shuffling up those, those arrays of figures, arrays of symbols, that is the, the what you do is you, you take something which is explicate which it has a diagonal and all the other ones are zero you then do something with it on two sides it fills up and then you get another diagonal but the diagonal has changed from the original diagonal so it's the way the change takes place and it's in that change that the quantum potential has a role to play because you're interested in conserving energy and all the things I've been talking about strictly conserve energy. Open systems is in a very different kettle of fish. Okay, does that, has that answered your question? 
Yeah, that's you know. really helpful. And the sec that second question, uh, what I was wondering was, what would be the implications? Oh, okay. I, I was hoping you'd forget your second question. Um, because <laughs> I really don't know. I'm hope hopeful that it, it will really move physics on a bit, particularly in the energy field. But I don't know. I'm, at the moment, as you know, dealing with those experiments, I showed you uh, the results we got, which really is confirming that we know how to get, use our experiment to get what is already known. And at the moment, we're very uh, intensely discussing how we're going to spot those kinks in the curves, let me put it that way. We have actually designed, Peter Barker has been very good at this, we're going to use lasers. What you can do, these boys, what they can do with lasers is unbelievable nowadays. Um, so what we're trying to see is if we can measure these things using uh, a laser beam. We've been struggling away with the theory. We think we have got know what we're talking about, and we just want to get back in the laboratory to set it up to see whether it'll actually work. But unfortunately, the college has been closed since March the 11th. And we've been very frustrated, wanting to get back. In fact, I don't know what mess we're going to find when we do get back. And, and if it worked, would that attract the attention or be likely to attract the attention of some of the skeptics? Yes, I, I think it will. Already, the Toronto experiment drew a lot of people's attention to it. But the problem with that one is that photons, that's quanta of light, don't have trajectories. And what they're really seeing is average momentum flows. And I don't know whether people how they react to the idea of, of momentum flow rather than a particle traveling along a railway line. But I've been talking in terms of momentum flow. Okay, so I, I don't know where it's going to lead. Eddie, I'll be quite honest with you. I'm afraid I don't have any cosmic insights. <laughs> <laughs> Shantina, maybe invite your voice in. Hi, Basil. Hi there. How are you doing? Oh, it's lovely listening to you. <laughs> I always understand 1%, but I'm charmed by my 1%. Um, one question about the Toronto experiment. Uh, they had to do, if I understand correctly, with weak measurement. Is that correct? Now here we have a debate can open up because we then have to ask what do we mean by a mean weak measurement? And I'll be quite blunt with you. It was the way when I saw what, uh, what they were doing, I then went and looked at what Aronoff and Vaidman God bless Lev Vaidman. And uh, I found that we didn't have to go to that extent. Most of the work is already done in one of Schweber's papers. Sorry, folks. I know Shantina knows a bit of physics. So I, I hope you don't mind me talking in this way. You go to... Oh, you wouldn't believe I got a telephone call. Hang on a minute. Um, Let me then complete my question. No, no, no. It, it's just transition probability amplitudes we're measuring. And that goes back to everything I've been talking about. Okay. Now, what we have to make sure is that in, when we use this laser, we only tickle the atom. I'm sorry to use this. We don't want it to change state. We want to change its phase, and I call that tickling it. And that's where it's weak, because if you try to tickle someone with force, 
you're in trouble. Tickling is being weak. Yeah. So it's in that sense. Just, just a minute. Hello, so, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Not me calling you, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Uh, the other okay. half of my question, which uh, it's maybe already hinted it in your in your answer, is how is that? Why? Why would that be especially helpful for revealing? The kinks, or I don't know how you would describe it. Because the kinks are going to reveal a local momentum. Now, if you take the uh, standard view that there is no such thing as a local momentum, that's why Bohr never put any pictures. So, um, you see, what does the uncertainty principle tell us? The uncertainty principle says that I cannot measure simultaneously X and P. Okay, I agree. You can't measure them simultaneously. But what does that mean? Does that mean that the particle, I still talk in terms of particles, that the particle doesn't have a well-defined position and momentum? Or does it mean that it doesn't have a well-defined position and momentum. You can't decide the answer to that. Bohr and the Copenhagen people say it cannot have, or you mustn't talk about it having a position and momentum. But if we can measure its momentum at a given position, then we've shown a way round the uncertainty principle but in a subtle way, doesn't mean to say we denied the uncertainty principle in total. We're changing the phase. And in the phase, that's where the momentum is encoded. And if we can measure the phase, that's, going, that's, that's something very intriguing. And that's what we're trying to do. The unit with photons, you said. Sorry? You're doing it with photons. No, we're doing it with argon atoms. Okay. Because they're closer to particles following trajectories. Yes. And if we confirm what the Toronto people have got, and that's a big if, which is experimental. Let me explain to people that we are really on the edge of technology at the moment. Because the thing, <clears throat> the <clears throat> first of all, we do everything in a vacuum. And then we're looking for changes of nanometers. Now a nanometer is point with nine noughts and a one or give or take. It's incredibly small and we have to amplify everything up. So these experiments are very delicate. I mean, the first thing we found was when we got this ball of atoms that I showed you in one of my transparencies, we thought it would be ever so simple. All you do is you just switch the lasers off and we'll see the fringes. No. The atoms are like a bunch of excited school kids. As soon as the bell goes for a break, they go in all different directions. We saw nothing. And we spent about, I don't know, probably about six months puzzling as why can't we see anything? Of course, the six months occurred because while we were doing this, one of the amplifiers blew up and we had to order a new one and we couldn't get, can't go to B and Q and get an amplifier off the shelf. You've got to find someone somewhere who's made these things. So, you know, absolutely frustrating the delays. But then what we found is, 
Well, Pauli was wrong. Pauli said, Bohm is stupid because he has to have a guiding field, like guiding children in the playground. Hey, man, we had to guide these damn things. We had to use a laser and push them in the right direction, push them to the school gate. Otherwise, they disappeared. And when we did that, that's what turned up that I, I showed you with that, that film. Once we'd mastered that, we then had our fringes. Now, having got those fringes, we now have to look inside the fringe. That's between um, the two slits and the camera. And we've got to do that very delicately using a laser. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Does that answer your question? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick so one. We have around 10 minutes left, and I have uh, a couple of people still wanted to bring in their questions. So, Moira. Moira? Yes, hi there. Uh, thank you so much. I, I have to confess I've never had a physics class in my life, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, very enchanted by what you're sharing here. I'm curious about the um, quantum cloud and if you could say a little bit more about how we're seeing the relationship of the implicate and explicate order in that structure for those who perhaps have never seen it in person. Well, well the idea is, um, and I think Anthony got it very nicely, is that as you move around it, you see clearly at one instant, there is a man shadow in there. And then as you move, the man disappears. And then looking from another view, he reappears again. I don't know whether you had that experience, but that was to try and illustrate this folding and unfolding. It's in our perception in this case, but it was trying to get a metaphor for what is actually going on in the real atomic world with this folding and unfolding. But the thing was pulsing into, into view and then disappear, pulsing back into view again. That was the idea. And I, I thought he's, from my point of view, he certainly caught what I was trying to get across in a very visual macroscopic way. Yeah, thank you. I think the visual example is so helpful with the concepts. So, well, thanks for yeah, well, most of my, t yeah, okay, not most of it. When I designed the talk, I had to try to bring in as many metaphors, pictures as I could. I hope I succeeded in sort of giving the drift of what was going on. I, I don't expect you to follow the mathematics. There'll be some people in the audience who will want to trip me up with the mathematics, but uh, it wasn't intended to be rigorous in any way. Thank you so just... much. Okay. No, really, thank you. Thank you. We have Joy and then after that, Chrissy. Joy? Hi. Well, I don't know. It's a very simple question, and um, uh, several people have already given me a couple of different answers. Um, just, uh, it seems to me that being is also a process, but apparently not. Um, but I'm still thinking well, excuse about me, it. Can I correct you? Being is a process. Ah, okay. That's what I was thinking. You must have missed it. Sorry, I, I hoped I made that clear, but obviously I didn't. Okay, carry on. Um. And so, because my understanding was that you were saying it was a, you know, process is not being. But it seems like in order to be, being is an ongoing process to be. But I might be wrong about that. I don't know. I was just thinking about it. No, I, I quite agree with you. I'm sorry I, I, I misled you. But certainly, I, I wanted to say the being and becoming are in two different places in the representation I was using. But being and becoming I, are process. 
So ah. being is a process which goes into itself. Right. It doesn't okay. stand still. Great. Nothing okay. Stands, yeah, nothing stands <laughs> still in my universe. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's how I was seeing it too. Okay. So um, great. Yeah, I did. I did misunderstand what you said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kissy. And for everybody else, if you have five more minutes, um, you can indicate in the chat if you have a question or click the raise hand button. So, Christy, go ahead. Yes. Basil, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm not a physicist, and I, um, it, I'm just fascinating how you explain that. I think my question is twofold. I understood that the topic of process as you said, dynamical structure of process or flow of process is very key in um, your and David Bohm's work. Can you say a bit more about that? And the second part of my question is referring to the philosophy. You said, as I understood it, overarching philosophy, implicate and explicate order, so to speak, as a philosoph overarching uh, philosophy and I, I have read that David Bohm was uh, dealing and uh, working with the process philosophers like Hegel and Whitehead and also ancient philosophers. Can you s tell us more about the connection between his uh, work with the philosophy and uh, his work with physics? Uh, well, let me take the second part of your question. It's very interesting, the idea of philosophy, where philosophy comes into David Bohm's work. We hardly ever talked about philosophy in the academic sense. What I do know is that he spent a lot of time reading Hegel, and Hegel influenced him quite considerably. Um, I think I, I said that he actually joined the Communist Party hoping he will find people who will, he could discuss Hegel with. And that's one of the naiveties of Dear David. I was more interested for my own personal reasons, because I had no idea what philosophy was. I kept, when I was talking about this pre-space, something beyond space and time, people kept saying, we well, can't, I refer you to Kant. And there we have the Kant's discussion of space-time, the upper priori nature of space-time, etc. And I said, well, 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 well but please, how do we go on? Then I happened to read Schelling and Fichte. Now, whether David read Schelling and Fichte, I don't know. But I had to read Schelling and Fichte. And then suddenly I began to see what the limitations were in the Kant philosophy for this problem. Please, when I talk about philosophy, I'm pinching a bit of their phil total philosophical thought for my own purposes in trying to understand what it means to be going beyond space and time. Okay. Oh, from abstracting space and time from this deeper process. Because this is what Penrose was doing when I started working with him. He had things called a spin network, which was a connection of things out of space time from which he obtained rotational symmetry. And then with his twisters, he gets translations, and so the, the space-time is being mapped out of that activity. Okay? Uh, but for me, you're asking about philosophy. I had to go, and I say, read Schelling and Fichte. But I then began to see what he was getting at. And then the other day, I found that Hermann Weil, who really started everything that Heisenberg did. It's called the, the vile group, which was fundamental to Heisenberg's group, etc., etc. He was into Fichte. Mm -hmm. 
and he had this idea uh, that it was the energy which was the more important thing. I forget what he called it now, Argons. I may be wrong. I may be wrong on that. I'm, I'm going back to the year dot. But there was energy involved in that. And when I sort of read Vile as well, oh, is that? Ah! And then Vile's book on group theory and quantum mechanics became within my reach. But without this overarching, what I'm calling an overarching, it's a viewpoint, isn't it? Rather than a philosophy, because a philosophy is usually well-defined. Hegel's philosophy involves A, B, C, D. It becomes an academic thing. And I'm not an academic philosopher. I pinch things from them if I find it helps me to get through trying to explain to people, trying to understand what is going on in the quantum world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the, you, I, I'm not sure I can say anything more about process. I, it's difficult for people, but I don't know how to... You either know what I'm talking about or you don't. Mm -hmm. And I do not know how to break down that barrier. Because mm -hmm. some guy, uh, a, a young guy, Glenn, uh, Glenn Dennis, who was going to do a PhD in chemistry, but got bored stiff and left. And then apparently he read the book that David and I wrote on the undivided universe. And it blew his mind and he said, I want to, can I come and talk to you? And we have been talking ever since. Now he's got no formal PhD education, but he knows he has this feeling of what process is. Mm -hmm. I have another student who looks at me and, okay, we won't say any more. It just, I don't know what it is. I can't get through to them. Mm -hmm. So I can't help you. Mm -hmm. You <laughs> helped me, Basil. Thank you very much. Okay. And we, uh, we think we have time for one more last question before I turn it to Eleanor for the closing with some news. Uh, Katrina. You're mute? Yeah, great. I'm here. Hi. Hi, Basil. Hi. So I, when you were talking about how the quantum potential for each atom or electron is, is unique, it, I really got thinking, I'm really about the consciousness perspective of it all. Um, and I, it really reminded me of Aristotle's formative cause. Mm -hmm. You know, you have all the bits and how they all work together. But then there's sort of this magical process that works towards the final cause, which reminds me of the quantum potential that seems to affect everything in ways that we can't anticipate you know it's sort of this quantum potential that's just doing this thing did you guys ever connect that formative cause with the quantum potential that there was some kind of process yep. there that yeah one of my, one of the first papers i wrote on this subject was looking at aristotle and what he meant by causality and going back to looking at the original greek and his causality sort of looking at what he said about it, relieved me of the causality that I had been taught, which is this rigid, if, it, if you kick it, it'll move. There's a much more subtle uh, causality in the, in, the, in, the, in the formal cause. And David and I spent some time dis debating this. We called it an informational potential. I didn't like the word informational potential because information has been taken up in Shannon. It's the amount of bits you can get down a channel. And this information we had in mind was not. It was actually forming from within. We were actually using the old roots of the word information to form from within. And therefore, in that sense, that's why I used the analogy of the uh, Formula One racing car. The energy is being changed in form from within the object itself, allowing it to use that energy in, in other ways. You know, that would seem to make it so hard to actually create a mathematical equation if the information is coming from the inside, you know, if the variables are changing themselves. Well, Schrodinger did it for us. I'm sorry, Schrodinger did it for us. 
And when Feynman was asked, where did Schrodinger get it from? His answer was, from nowhere. It came out of the mind of Schrodinger. Hey, I don't know what to make of that, man. Doesn't help me. <laughs> Thank you, Basil. Okay. So, Basil, there are a couple of questions in the chat to have that link to your that article that you're referring to. So, could you send that to Eleonore, and then we can share it. Which, which article is that? The, the one that you wrote on um, on Aristotle's causes. The oh, one that you that just one. referred to now. Your that one. Okay, that's a very primitive paper. <laughs> Well, you sparked, you sparked many people's interest, so you... It's one of the first, first papers I ever wrote. So it's probably a load of rubbish. <laughs> Anyways, okay, if it... I'll if send you, you a copy. Wonderful. And email me if I don't. I, I, I will bug you, you know I will. Yeah, but, but <laughs> if you know me, I sort of say, yes, I'm going to do that, and then... I go and have a cup of tea and somebody asks me something else and, and, and so on and so forth. That's my anyway, excuse for being absent-minded. Anyways, I'll just take this opportunity to thank you, Basil. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you uh, for this amazing session and it sparked so much interest and the chat is just full of questions, but we just didn't, we didn't manage to get to everybody's question. I'm sorry about that, but thank you, Basil. Thank you for being here today. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope to see you all tomorrow for Shantena Sabadini's um, presentation. So again, we'll open the, the room at 5.30 and then at 5.30, uh, that's Italy time. And, um, and then the session will start at six o'clock. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Basil. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.